Okay, it looks like we're getting critical mass here. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our discussion on Afghanistan and the future of American foreign policy. My name is Miles Hansen. I'm the president and CEO of World Trade Center Utah. And we're so excited to have this discussion on such a timely, important issue. Um, we've all been watching uh, on the news and reading the newspaper. Boyd has been uh, in the news uh, talking about Afghanistan. Um, it has been a, a difficult uh, a period of time over the past several months as, as we've seen uh, the Taliban uh, take over Afghanistan. Here in the state of Utah, we're working very hard to make Utah the most welcoming state in the nation for Afghan refugees. Just had a meeting yesterday uh, associated with the Afghan Community Fund. Um, to date, we've raised $550,000 uh, that it will go directly towards supporting Afghan refugees that are coming here to the state of Utah. We're grateful for uh, Governor Spencer Cox's leadership in uh, letting the administration know that Utah is, is open to accepting uh, these refugees. And we've got uh, a, a partner here, Bahman Bakhtiari. Bahman, I'll talk a bit more about your background here in a minute, that is working very hard uh, with the community. Uh, to date, we've welcomed more than 200 Afghans here to the state of Utah, and we anticipate another 650 or so, um, with perhaps more to follow. And so this is something that's, it, it's, it's something that everybody in the United States has been watching and, and, and trying to better understand what it means for the United States, what's happening, what it means for the United States, and what it means for the broader Middle East and our foreign policy as we move forward. And we have no one better uh, to help us understand that than Ambassador Mark Grossman. So Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. You know, real quick, for anybody who's joining for the first time, uh, World Trade Center Utah, we exist to accelerate growth for Utah businesses. We do that through our global network, our international programs, and our business services. And we're helping Utah companies, you know, increase international sales, uh, help them resolve supply chain challenges. Um, we're in the midst of a global supply chain crisis. That's another topic for another day. Um, but there's something that we are spending significant time and energy helping our businesses navigate these supply chain challenges. And we also help facilitate international partners and investment and capital uh, partnerships. And so if you're a company that is in need of any assistance with engaging internationally, please reach out. We wanna hear from you. We have people on the team that can sit down with you or your teams and assess what it is that, that you need as you engage with the, with the world and how it is that we can plug in and provide assistance. And now it's my great honor to, to introduce uh, two phenomenal friends and, and partners here. We have Boyd Matheson, who is the host of Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Boyd, I like to tell people that you are the Arthur Brooks of Utah. There's nobody that I know that is as thoughtful, as principled, pragmatic, um, knows how to think through problems and come up with just common sense solutions uh, than Boyd. Um, prior to his role at KSL News Radio, uh, Boyd was the opinion editor for the Desert News, the executive director of the Sutherland Institute, chief of staff to Mike Lee, and has had a phenomenal career in business, in government, in politics, um, both in Washington, D.C. and here in Utah. So, Boyd, uh, thank you for being with us today and taking part in this discussion. Great great to be with you. Really looking forward uh, to this with the ambassador. Uh, really a lot of important things to, to be talking about. Love the partnership and uh, any chance to elevate the dialogue and engage people in meaningful conversations. Utah's an important place to do that. Great. Thank you, Boyd. I'm also very excited to be joined by Bah with uh, Bahman Bakhtiari. Bahman is a close uh, friend of mine as well. He's the executive director of the Baskerville Institute, uh, previously ran the University of Utah's Middle East program, is a great thought leader and author. Uh, what I've realized is Bahman has great expertise on, on Iran. And if there's anybody nationally uh, that, that you have heard of that is an Iran expert, Bahman is their close friend. I'm always impressed, Bahman, at, at your network and how everybody that knows you and has worked with you instantly is willing to jump in to participate in the things that you are working on. I think that says a lot about you, your character and your leadership. And Bahman it had the connection with Ambassador Grossman and facilitated today's discussion. So Bahman, thank you for being with us. And at this point, Bahman, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you to introduce Ambassador Grossman. At that point, Boyd will jump in with the first question. And for everybody participating, the way we want to structure this as is an informal conversation around the kitchen table. We have a lot of questions prepared, but we're going to see where the discussion takes us. We'll pause with about 20 minutes left. Um, please submit your questions through the chat function. Uh, Rayanne will be keeping an eye out for those, and that will help us steer the conversation 
uh, particularly in those last 20 or 30 minutes or so. So please don't be shy, ask your questions, let us know that you wanna hear about, and then we'll go ahead and just keep the conversation going um, for the, uh, the, the hour that we have set aside for this. And so Bahman, I'll go ahead and, and pass the baton to you. Well, thank you very much, Miles, and thank you, Lloyd, and uh, World Trade Center for helping to organize this important event. And I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Ambassador Mark Grossman. Currently, Ambassador Grossman is the vice chair of the Cohen Group in Washington. Founded by former Secretary of Defense, Bill Cohen, the Cohen Group it provides uh, regional expertise and uh, global business consulting services around the world, including Middle East, which is a very much of a focus for us here. Before joining the Cohen Group, Ambassador Grossman had a 29 year career, distinguished career in foreign service. He held the third highest rank in the State Department as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Before that, he was Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. And before that, he was Ambassador to Turkey. So altogether, his 29 year career as Foreign Service Ambassador Grossman has had significant impact on American foreign policy decision making and directions of our foreign policy. In, uh, as Assistant Secretary for European Affairs, he coordinated NATO's uh, military campaign in Kosovo. And in Turkey, as ambassador to Turkey, he revitalized the US-Turkish political, military, and economic relations. So many of the developments today that we notice in Europe and in the Middle East, particularly in Turkey, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ambassador Grossman has had a major role in the decision making. In 2011, even though he was retired, and I understood that he had a very happy life at Cohen Group, he was called back by the State Department again to join the State Department, this time as a special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. A very critical role at that time because the US administration, just like we are witnessing today, was very interested to kind of coordinate international efforts, bring the partners together and seek a peace solution for what was happening at, in Afghanistan, 30 year war at that time. And I believe Ambassador Grossman coordinated those leadership. They had major meetings in Istanbul, Bonn, Chicago, and he provided critical advice to the administration on US-Pakistan relations at that time. So it was a critical period in US foreign policy and Ambassador Grossman's leadership as a special envoy for those two countries provided critical advice to the administration. He returned back to Cohen Group as vice chair in 2013, but while he is still working as a vice chair at the Cohen Group, he holds the positions of a trustee at the uh, University of California Santa Barbara Foundation. He is the vice chair board of trustees of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And he's also a uh, vice chairman of the board of the Living uh, <clears throat> Foundation of the Foreign Service Institute. So we are very pleased to have him today for this conversation about Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as Miles mentioned, this is a conversation format and we are delighted to have him today for this conversation. Wonderful, thank you, Altman. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, it, it's clear with uh, your talent and skill, uh, you're sort of like living in the uh, Hotel California. You can check out, you can retire, you just can't leave. Uh, they're just gonna keep bringing you back. And uh, we're grateful to have you here today. And uh, I thought maybe, Mr. Ambassador, we could start uh, as we should begin all good tabletop discussions with a, a clear understanding of, of where we are. So could you give us a, a framing, kind of a beginning and end uh, for this discussion in terms of why we initially were in Afghanistan, where things ended up? Was that successful? Just give us some framing for the discussion today. Sure. Thank you very much, boy. Thank you for that. And uh, any reference to Hotel California is all right with me. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. And Bahman, thank you very much for that very, very kind invitation. And Miles, thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Uh, all of my interactions so far in the World Trade Center, uh, Utah, have just been fantastic. And so I'm very much looking forward to this hour. If I might just make one personal note, I had a chance to visit Utah for the very first time in my life uh, just after Labor Day uh, this year. Uh, we came out, my wife and I, to see a friend of hers who lives in Salt Lake City in the national parks, and it was just fantastic. And so when Bachman called and said I could continue this relationship with Utah, I jumped at it. So uh, thank you very much. 
Um, but let me try to answer your question. Uh, when, you, when you think back to why did we get in Afghanistan in the first place? Why did we in intervene there militarily? The answer is a simple one. The answer is 9-11. And uh, the, the administration, the American public, uh, we knew, we believed uh, that that terrorist attack, which took place uh, in the United States of America, in New York and Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., had been planned in Afghanistan, had been practiced in Afghanistan, came from Afghanistan. And so I think the biggest moment of clarity uh, in all of this relationship we have with Afghanistan is that moment uh, when there was no question why we went there. We went there to seek revenge and to teach a lesson and to say that you cannot attack the United States of America the way people did on 9-11 and have it go uh, without any answer. And so the, the, the initial answer is really clear. If you think about then for the years that go by, was it successful, you ask? Well, in some ways it was successful in the sense that if you take, as I often did, the one sentence issue of why are we in Afghanistan? We're in Afghanistan to make sure that never again should Afghanistan be a place where a terrorist attack is planned or, uh, or motivated from uh, on, our, on the United States of America, our friends and our allies, that was successful. Um, if you looked at, at some of the other issues, you know, the honest answer is it's mixed, right? So we invested an enormous amount there over 20 years. And don't forget, so did our friends, so did our allies. People invested enormously there to open an opportunity for people in Afghanistan to live a different kind of life, to live a kind of life that they wanted so that they could make choices about their own lives. And I think there's something to be proud of there. But you end up today, where are we? We are in a place where we've left Afghanistan. And so why did that effort not succeed? It didn't succeed because you couldn't overcome the tribalism in Afghanistan. You couldn't overcome weakness in the government of Afghanistan. Uh, you couldn't overcome you know, the safe havens that were around Afghanistan. You couldn't overcome corruption. And finally, also extremely important, is that I think the American public lost interest in being in Afghanistan. And for me, you cannot ask America's young men and women to serve in places where they're not supported by the public. You didn't write. And so when I look back, I think there was clarity in the beginning. And again, we just have to honor all of those who served in Afghanistan, diplomatic, intelligence people, military people, our friends, our allies. What started with clarity and ended up a larger mission. Um, and that's how I think we ended up where we are today. You know, Ambassador Grossman, I, I think it's a really, really important point in that there was clarity in the beginning, and then slowly it turned from a, a response to 9-11 and to make sure that Afghanistan was not a haven for terrorists, and then it entered into a nation-building phase. And this idea that we, we wanted, in order to accomplish that original objective, we wanted to go build a strong, successful, democratic Afghanistan and Afghan government. Could you maybe dial in a little bit on, on that transition? Because that strikes me as being a, an incredibly important part of this narrative about the, the US experience in Afghanistan. When did that transition take place and why did it take place? Well, I'd say three things. One is, is that no question that there was this transition. And in some ways, and, uh, I, I, in some ways when I look back, you know, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a thing to be ashamed of. I don't think it's a thing to be ashamed of to say, that part of this effort was to offer Afghans a way to make choices about their own lives, a way to get more women and girls in school, a way to get more press, a way to get more freedom. Those things are, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, I don't think things to be, to be ashamed of. I, I think what happened in all of this is partially is the, the, the most senior people in government got distracted by Iraq, of course, in 2003. And so Part of the answer is, is that the people lost focus on Afghanistan. And in a sense, kind of the, the, the bureaucracy took over, right? And there were these objectives set out to change the country of Afghanistan. Um, and, and I think that's a very important point. And then third, as I said to Boyd, um, I think that this effort ran up against some insurmountable obstacles, some things that were never going to change. Uh, but again, if you look back on the effort, and here I don't, you know, I don't disparage anyone who went there and tried and did the best that they could, um, but that they were up against obstacles that in the end uh, were not surmountable, even by the best of intentions. Um, and so I look back and I think 
you know, this is, this is how this happened. I, I think you're, you know, in the topic today, uh, the question of Afghanistan and the future of foreign policy, that's where this is connected, Miles, which is to say, I hope, from speaking personally, you know, that we're much more careful in the future about that kind of expansion of the, of the effort and make sure that, you know, people really know what it is, first of all, that we're trying to accomplish and B, make a, make a clear um, a case and a clear understanding that it can be accomplished. Yeah, and Boyd, before you jump into the question, just a quick perspective to underscore that point, Ambassador Grossman, I was in Afghanistan uh, in 2008, in nor Northern Afghanistan, and I don't know of, of the, all the places in the world I've been and the years I spent living internationally, I have never been in a more inspiring place than Mazari Sharif in 2008. We were staying with a the family. They showed us where the Taliban, you know, just you know, seven or eight years earlier would do public hangings and execute people. And then you talk to these young people, they're 17, 18, 19, 20 year old uh, boys and girls and asking them what they wanted to do with their lives. And they talked about being doctors and lawyers. One said he wanted to be a politician and make sure that the Taliban could never come back into power. And as somebody who was early on in my career, that was so inspiring. And the US involvement created the space where these, uh, these wonderful Afghan people had an opportunity to flourish. And then you've identified all the various obstacles that, that, that prevented us and them in realizing uh, those dreams and those hopes. And it's, it's frankly devastating to see things play out. Yes, I think if I could just, before Boyd asked the next question, you know, you may have put it better. I, I, I said, you know, we had opened up the possibilities and you said, you know, you created this space. And as I say, I, I, I think that's an important thing. And, and a lot was accomplished um, it, during, during the period, as you say, especially at the time that you were there. The issue then, the issue then became, how do you sustain it? And how, do you put the, how did you put America in a position of recognizing that in the end, this was the Afghans fight and we were there to support them. And, and I think that's in the end why these insurmountable obstacles were, were insurmountable. Well, Mr. Ambassador, let's, let's maybe look at uh, kind of two components in terms of both the, the withdrawal uh, and then what that really signals. Is that really uh, signaling a shift in terms of our foreign policy and our approach to, to these kinds of things? What does that project in terms of, of the future as well? Yeah, but I think that's a great question and one that, that everybody on this call should really contemplate. Let me take both, both pieces of that. First, on the exit. Um, one of the things I think that's important for the audience and for all of us to reflect on is, of course, that President Biden was really following a path set by President Trump, who said, this isn't, you know, we need to get out of Afghanistan. And he had, you know, his peace process and some other things. But, the, but you could tell that the fundamental effort uh, for President Trump was to end this war. Uh, and then President Biden actually ends it. And why is that? Because as we've talked about here over the last few minutes, no public support in the United States left for this mission. Um, and so if you don't have public support, you can't have a, a diplomatic policy, a military policy abroad. You need, that's the fundamental question in a democracy. Are people prepared to support this policy and support these efforts? And so I think I can understand why President Biden finally said 20 years is enough and we're going to do differently here. You know, each of one of us uh, with our own experience in Afghanistan might have, might have come to some slightly different conclusion, but that's the conclusion he came to. Um, and I think the fact that he did it um, is going to have an impact, as you say, on, on the future of foreign policy. And I'll come to that in a second. Then you can see, then the question of how was this exit executed? So this exit was executed in a way clearly um, that, that wasn't the most efficient and it wasn't the easiest way forward. But I hope that you and your audience would allow me one parenthesis here. We forget sometimes that from the 16th of August to the 30th of August, 124,000 people were evacuated from Afghanistan. That's an historic number. Nobody's ever done anything like that before. And so U.S. diplomats, U.S. intelligence officers, U.S. military personnel, they accomplished something enormous. And, and clearly, there was a lot of chaos. And clearly, we can't forget the 13 lives that were lost there trying to help Afghans get out of the country. But 124,000 people is, a, is an astonishing accomplishment. And the fact that now some of those people will end up in Utah 
you know, is a great credit to you and a great credit to all of you. But that's a, that's a lot of people. So when you think about two questions going forward, one is if you're today probably at the State Department or at the Pentagon or at the CIA, you're thinking, well, let's have a lessons learned uh, about you know, how we could have done that better. Um, and I hope people are doing that. And then secondly, the larger question was, you know, does, it, does, it, does, it, does it signal a difference and a change in American foreign policy? I think it does. I think President Biden's not interested in fighting these wars. And he's looking at a grand strategy that has to do with great power competition. He's looking at a strategy that very much has to do with climate change, with global health, and very importantly, from my perspective, to come back to this theme, reconnecting some of our foreign policy to domestic questions in the United States so that people in Utah and others who are watching us today feel that they have a stake in this foreign policy, that it matters to them and that it benefits them. You know, Ambassador Grossman, this, uh, before diving in more into kind of those, those long-term issues, because that's absolutely fundamental. And as somebody who's worked a lot with foreign policy and national security, I've really had to think deeply myself about what lessons do we learn and what does this mean as we think about America's role in the world. Um, I'd like to dial in perhaps some of the lessons learned on the process of how we exited. As I fully agree, it, there is time for, for the war to end, 20 years, uh, you know, two plus trillion dollars, depending on how you calculate it. You know, more than 2,000 lives lost, 20,000 people injured. Um, absolutely, uh, in my mind, time to figure out how to wind this up. Um, the months between uh, April and August seem like that those were really critical months. I'd be curious for your take on to, you know, what, looking back and hindsight is, is, is always 2020, what are there things that we could have done in that time period in order to uh, prevent what we all watched uh, live on uh, on CNN and Al Jazeera and whatnot in, in, in mid-August? And then the one last thing I'll just add quickly is uh, you're absolutely right. Between August 16th and the end of August, you know that is an absolutely historic, uh, you know, airlift and air bridge of people out of Afghanistan. And just want to note that one of the service members uh, that was tragically killed is from Utah, and so somebody, from, uh, a Marine from Utah. Um, early in his career, had a family. And so that, that the sacrifice uh, that he and the others made in order to facilitate this air bridge out is something that here in the state of Utah, uh, we, we deeply appreciate because it was one of our own that, that gave his life uh, in that effort. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And as I say, I, when I speak to people, I, I, I try very hard to get people to focus on that 124,000 number and the 13 people who lost their lives and the sacrifices that were made by many others to try to get this, uh, as you very rightly described it, air bridge going. You know, I think two things. One is that it, if you say to me, you know, what were the things that could have been done differently between April and August? I don't know the answer to that question because I wasn't there. And I think those are questions that are going to have to be answered by, you know, the people who were in charge. And I will bet you that we will find out that people were doing their best to make the contingency plans that were necessary. Um, and that's certainly, I think you'll find that on the civilian side. On the military side, again, I think the lesson learned um, will have to be surrounding this question of, and I understand completely how our military um, came to say that faster is safer, right? That the quicker they could leave, uh, the, the more safely that they could get everybody out. And you see what an enormous accomplishment that was as well. The issue is, you know, whether, whether that, that speed kind of hindered other things that were trying to go on in Afghanistan. And I think that would be my question. But I'll give you a specific thought, and I, I, I recognize my bias here. But I think to myself, you know, we've been, a number of us have been trying to think through and propose, not our idea, it's a long-term idea. You know, think if there would have been a diplomatic reserve corps like there are reserve components from our military, right? And you would have been able to deploy that reserve corps maybe in those months or certainly um, in the days that people were trying to do all that work at Kabul, Karzai International Airport. And again, I don't take a minute away from the people who did the work at Karzai International Airport and lots of people came to help them. But I would have hoped, I, and I hope in the future, one lesson learned will be we need a more organized diplomatic reserve corps 
to step into situations like that, exactly like our military colleagues, each service has a reserve. Uh, the State Department and the diplomatic service needs one as well. Yeah. So, Mr. Ambassador, maybe we can go to kind of the broader uh, Middle East and kind of how this uh, impacts everything that, that is happening there and kind of the U.S. role in the world kind of back at the table in a lot of interesting discussions. Uh, how do you see that playing out? What is that broader role in terms of the Middle East? Well, I, I, let me come to the Middle East in a second, Boyd, because I think one of the interesting issues here, especially because Afghanistan is kind of between Asia and the Middle East, is the issue of kind of what next in our foreign policy. And the whole question is, Miles said about strategy. And, and I think at the moment, um, there, there is a, a strategy that's very important for all of us on this call to keep considering, and that's the Indo-Pacific strategy. And of course, the Indo-Pacific strategy, President Biden is now, what, the fifth president uh, to be developing this Indo-Pacific strategy. But it's got clarity now, as it did in beginning with President Trump and now with President, President Biden and President Obama. But you have, I think, this kind of consideration of how do we manage um, U.S. relations in the Pacific? The United States is a Pacific power. There are a lot of issues out there. Um, and I think one of the things to watch for you and for, for the companies that are on this call and others are, is kind of what becomes of the Indo-Pacific strategy? How does it evolve? And it'll evolve, I think, in many ways. I thought it was very interesting that you know, President Biden and President Xi had this conversation last night. It seems quite an interesting thing. But the Indo-Pacific strategy has got military pieces, diplomatic pieces, and commercial pieces as well. And so I recommend people keep an eye on the commercial conversation out there, um, especially among the nations of the Quad, India, Japan, the United States, um, and Australia. Second thing is, I think you see in the Biden administration um, an effort to kind of engage allies again. And I think that's, a, that's a, co a conscious strategy that they have. And then finally, again, um, in the new world, uh, there's no question, as I said before, that uh, among the high end of strategies abroad will be climate change um, and how climate change has infused every bit of American diplomacy uh, since the administration came in. Very interesting thing for me as a practitioner to watch. And then finally, again, I think there's a real effort to try to realign our foreign policy with the needs and aspirations of people in the United States. You know, they're calling it a foreign policy for the middle class. And that's an interesting way to talk about it. But what it is, is I think one of the reasons that you had Afghanistan end so abruptly was there's this misalignment between kind of what an American would, would consider her or his national interest and what the elites talk about as national interest. And you saw it in Afghanistan. And, and President Biden, I think, trying very hard as President Trump did to realign um, these things. If you ask me about the Middle East, um, I, I think that um, we'll continue obviously to have enormous interest there. Uh, again, I think the fact that President uh, Biden um, has welcomed and continued the Abraham Accords uh, to try to get diplomatic relations between Israel and some of uh, the Arab countries and the Gulf countries. This is, if you'd allow me to jump ahead, an enormous opportunity uh, for business people. Um, and when you think about what would be on the agenda for World Trade Center Utah, you know, trade missions out there, connections with those countries, you think about the changes you know, you think about Israeli technology uh, being able to be connected to the rest of the world, uh, rest of the region through the Abraham Accords, the effort in Saudi Arabia to change their economy from just extractives to, you know, technology and healthcare and all the other things, UAE, Qatar, um, there are just opportunities, it seems to me, everywhere. And so we will continue as a country to pay a lot of attention to the Middle East. Um, and I hope that uh, we will do so with our own commercial interests clearly in mind. Great. There was a, a lot there, Ambassador Grossman, and I'm, I'm excited to dive in deeper. Before we leave Afghanistan, to jump in a few of these other issues, I did, I'm did. i seeing a lot of audience questions coming in about Afghanistan. I see we have several uh, veterans uh, that have served in Afghanistan, multiple tours on the calls. We're grateful for, for, for your service uh, to our nation. 
And I think it's encouraging whether or not you're a veteran, you know, veterans, uh, watching everything happen in Afghanistan, I know it's been a, a difficult emotional time. You know, I had a very kind of tangential involved with Afghanistan and it, it challenged my assumptions and made me think very deeply. I know it was very difficult for people who sacrificed immensely in order to be there in Afghanistan. Um, one question from one of these veterans uh, about the Taliban, you know, Ambassador Grossman, you know, do you consider the Taliban a, a terrorist group? You know, how do we, and it may broaden that a little bit, what would be your recommendation to the administration about how we engage the Taliban moving forward? It's difficult, you know, just on, uh, just yesterday, I was, I was reading up on Afghanistan a little bit. You see these pictures of uh, the intense human suffering that's happening in Afghanistan right now. The Taliban are not well equipped to govern the country. There are food shortages, there are energy shortages. Winter is coming uh, with all the increased challenges that that brings for the Afghan people. And so what would be your advice on how the administration engages uh, with Afghanistan? And then from there, as I look through some of these other questions, I think we've pretty well covered the waterfront on some of these other Afghanistan specific questions coming in. So then Boyd, at this point, you know, Ambassador Grossman gave us a good menu of things to dive into. So this will be our last Afghanistan question. And then Boyd, why don't you go ahead and, and you can pick and choose what you want to dive into next. Good, thank you. Uh, on Afghanistan, I mean, I think every single person who had anything to do with Afghanistan, diplomatic, intelligence, military, commercial, everybody um, has watched these last few months kind of with part of their heart and part of their head. How could it be otherwise? And so I recognize that emotion. I've had it myself, right? I mean, I, I, my first post in the Foreign Service was Pakistan, 1977 to 79. I went to Af Afghanistan, if you can imagine, I drove there, hard to imagine now, but you know, this is part of my life. And the two years I gave as, as special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, you know, I have a commitment to this. And, you have to, and, and it's absolutely normal and right to look at it both with your head and your heart. And so I, I, I fe have felt a lot of these emotions as well these past few weeks and the past few months. So I would say in answer to your question, first of all, on the Taliban. So as you know, when I was the special representative and Bahman was nice enough to, to talk about it, you know, the job I was given by President Obama and Secretary Clinton was to see if we could open up some conversation with the Taliban, which would end with uh, peace negotiations between Afghan parties, right? Afghans talking to other Afghans about the future of Afghanistan. Didn't work. Um, but I had a chance to meet some of them in that kind of professional situation. So my advice would be three. Number one, people have to deal with this humanitarian crisis, Miles, just as you described it. But I don't think this is going to be a responsibility of the United States. If I was giving advice, this is a responsibility of the United Nations or other international organizations, because our, our role there is too fraught right now to be front and center for solving this humanitarian crisis. I'm not saying we shouldn't contribute to it. I'm not saying we shouldn't support it. But my advice is that's not for the United States to lead right now. That's a UN question or another NGO, but it has to be done. I, I wanna be clear, I'm not trying to avoid this. I'm just saying from the US perspective, maybe not the best thing for us to be in the front of. Second thing is the Taliban. So my advice, and maybe this is wrong, you, you have many people on this call who have lots of experience. <clears throat> I understand why people are saying right now, gosh, we gotta have this relationship with the Taliban, right? I'd wait. I'd like to see what the Taliban's gonna do. I I'm not for rushing at this. You know, let's see what their position's gonna be on women's rights, on girls in school, on whether women can work in the government. You know, I, there's a lot of questions to be answered. And uh, I, I understand why people are interested in this question, but I would just wait. And I think what the administration did by asking the government of Qatar to be our, um, our protecting power in Afghanistan, really smart. Because um, the Qataris, of course, know a lot about Afghanistan. So fair enough. Um, but I, me, I'm, I'm not rushing to have a great close relationship with the Taliban at this stage. Let's see, what, let's see how they act. So maybe looking at kind of some some broader applications, uh, both from what we experienced in Afghanistan and then some broader things from from your unique perspective, Mr. Ambassador, we we often talk about the the real leadership quality for the 21st century is being able to have 
allies and alliances in in different situations. You have many countries out there that we go head to head in on human rights or climate or uh, pollution or whatever it might be. And then we also need them to be our allies uh, in dealing with places like North Korea. Uh, from your unique perspective, what are those lessons? How should we be looking at that as uh, we look at the at the world today? Well, I think that's a great question. I mean, first, <clears throat> the great strength of the United States of America, especially if, uh, when compared to some other uh, countries in the world, is we do have allies and friends, and and those are some those are things to be cherished. And so I think the idea um, of kind of recommitting to NATO, uh, recommitting to the transatlantic relationship, looking for ways to do more in Latin America, uh, finding ways, especially on the business side, to do more in Africa. Um, I think the Quad as a four country proposition, and then working more closely with ASEAN and the other institutions in Asia, those are really important things. And I hope we will continue to do them, Republican or Democratic administration. So what you asked a great question and I, you know, my flip answer is, you know, that's what diplomats get to do, right? Which is to balance these questions of, you know, how much climate change today and how much North Korea today. Um, and, and, but you have to have some big idea about what you're trying to accomplish as a country. And I know there's a big debate and I, I, you know, about you know, grand strategy and is it possible, but you do have to have some way to think about the relationship between means and ends and aspirations and resources. Um, and so, so if you're a diplomat, you need clarity from the people above you to say, we wanna go in this direction and, and you can help us then execute that policy and get the balance right and the truth is that on, on most days, because the United States is involved all around the world, that all of these questions are important. And, but, the, but, the, but the issue is how to balance them. And you only can balance them by having some big thought about where you're headed. And maybe if I can jump in and, and uh, double down on that one, uh, Mr. Ambassador, what do you think that big idea should be? You know, we always talk about focus <laughs> precedes success. I think that's what you're describing. Where should that focus be? Well, I think it should be in, in kind of three areas. Um, one is, I think it's right over the past few, uh, maybe the last three presidents, I think it's right to focus on kind of great power competition again um, and, and, and make terrorism, counterterrorism, not, not go away and not unimportant, but be a secondary question, right? So from 9-11 for 10 or 12 or 15 years, terrorism was the top question, fair enough. But I think this shift from the Obama administration, Trump, Biden, to kind of raising the salience of great power competition, I think that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a sensible thought. And so that would be the first thing I would say. Second is to recognize that there are all of these other transnational questions that are out there: climate, health, um, that being you know two of the major ones, obviously. Um, and, and there has to be, you have to find a place in your diplomacy for those things as well. Uh, and so those are important issues. And then third, the theme I keep coming back to, and I, I don't mean to be repetitive or boring, but I do think a big thought here is realigning the definition of national interest between citizens and leaders. And I think that we, 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 we've gotten those out of alignment. And one of the reasons that uh, I think there's been a challenge to get public support for our foreign policy. And, and if others on this call who are not Americans would allow me, uh, I think it's true of other countries as well, um, that, 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 there's, that there are these misaligned, that, that, that we got out of alignment. And one big job of leadership today, one big issue of grand strategy, if you'd allow me, is to get that alignment, get that, get that alignment realigned. I'm taking a lot of notes here, Ambassador. Means and ends, aspirations and resources, this shift back from putting a priority on non-state terrorist organizations back to state actors and great power competition. I think you're exactly right about that. Thinking about getting this alignment back, and I appreciate that previously you talked about the importance of trade here at World Trade Center Utah. Obviously, trade is something that's top of mind for us. What is... Uh, in, uh, one of the biggest takeaways I've had since leaving the National Security Council and coming back to Utah over the past few years and working here 
to help Utah companies and institutions and universities engage with the rest of the world is the realization for me that America's greatest power is our soft power. And the vast majority of that soft power, how we influence the rest of the world is coming from the companies, the innovators, the inventors, uh, the, our, our world-class higher education system, drawing in the best and brightest from around the world that come study here in the United States. And all of that is, is occurring at the subnational level. That's right. not to say that hard power is not critical and essential. It's just if you look at the way that the world has changed the past 70 years, it's these instruments of soft power that arguably, arguably has had a greater influence on, on the world. And in my opinion, a, a significant leavening effect on the rest of the world coming from our, our, our private sector, our, our, our public universities and whatnot. What advice would you have for us here in the state of Utah as we work to really optimize our this kind of this subnational engagement as, as we try to, to take the soft power out in, in the rest of the world? What advice would you have for us on, on how we can do that effectively as we are supporting our companies and universities and other institutions with their global engagement? And then yeah. Tie into this whole idea of having a uh, foreign policy that works for the middle class. Yeah, thanks. I, I think that I think that's a great question. But just allow me two comments, though. One is I don't want anybody on this call to, to say or to think that I'm not, I don't think that terrorism is still an important question. I do. And so I, I think that you described it really well, which is to kind of put this question of national state actors and global competition and great power competition. You know, back up at the top, but I think we're still going to be facing a terrorist terrorist issues for a long time to come. So I, I think that's still very important. Secondly, um, I think one of the interesting things about COVID nineteen was COVID nineteen, the year twenty twenty, it exposed in some ways, certainly for me, a lot of these misalignments. Right when when citizens said, "What's in my national interest?" Well, my national interest is, gosh, I think that our country ought to produce in PPP PPE, right? I, gosh, I think that I'm surprised to hear that so much of our medicine comes from outside the country, right? How did it happen that in the United States of America, you know, no, there's no company making the equipment, the equipment for 5G, right? That's all gone someplace else. And so I think that's part of this conversation. Um, and, uh, and, and you see it in, in, in chips, for example, in microchips, where there's a great shortage, right? And you see how the administration has said, Part of our domestic spending will be to increase the capacity to do some of these things in the United States. And so I'm not a protectionist and I am in favor of world trade, um, but it's right that there be a debate and a conversation about kind of what, what's required uh, for the United States of America, and again, for many of the countries involved on this call. So I would say for Utah, one, it's really not for me to give any advice to people who've been so, so, so successful as you. And I'll give you this example. So again, I told you I had the chance to visit Utah for the very first time in my life in September. And I drove from Salt Lake City down to Provo on my way to the national parks. Well, you think of the difference at 40 miles from Salt Lake City to Provo, and I'm not giving you any advice about how to be more successful because you've already been enormously successful. And that's the answer to the question which is to say, just as you did, that the power of our innovation and the power of our capacity to create that 40 miles and replicate it you know, in many, many places around the world is, is fantastic. The other thing I thought was fantastic about you know, Utah and studying for this, for this presentation is you all are on a conscious effort to move a little like Saudi Arabia from extractives to a more balanced economy. And fantastic, and look at the success that you have had there, the growth in your economy, the distribution in your economy. So I, I would say that, you're, that, that you are bringing in the resources that you need, you're channeling them in the right direction. And right now, you know, you're a model for other people uh, around the country and around the world about thinking about what the future, future challenges and the future opportunities will be like.
Mr. Messer, I, I want to unpack this a little bit more on uh, this this role of business and our foreign policy and, and impacts. Uh, we often talk about uh, it's really entrepreneurs and businesses that that drive freedom. Uh, even back to the beginning, we we talk about founding fathers, uh, great, noble, and wise for sure. Uh, they were also just a bunch of, of business people who were tired of being overtaxed and overregulated and too intrusive. Uh, and often in our foreign policy, you know, we have either sent in military or we've sent in vast amount of money to prop up little democracies around the world. Uh, when it seems to me the real answer is to make sure there is a system in place that can actually support entrepreneurs, businesses. Uh, what do we need to do from, a, again, from our foreign policy perspective? What can those on this call really look to in terms of how do businesses really drive that freedom and, and at the same time be successful? Well, that's a great question, Boyd. And I would say it, it kind of goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. So one of my great privileges when I was in the Foreign Service was to do what we then called commercial work, right? Which was to help American companies do business abroad. And one of the things we took very great pride in, in Turkey was increasing the amount of, uh, of two-way trade between Turkey and the United States, to increase the amount of investment from the United States in Turkey, to create jobs in the United States. And I know that's one of the objectives of the World Trade Center of Utah. So if you say to me, what is it that people on this call can be in favor of to create that environment, I have this to say. It's the rule of law, the rule of law, and the rule of law. And so if you think about an American foreign policy that's got human rights as a part of it, that's important because people need the freedom to, as you say, to, to create and to live their own lives. But fundamentally, when you think about, and, I'm, and I, don't, I know many people make these decisions on this call every day, when people think about investing in another country, buying from another country, dealing with another country, what is it they think of? The rule of law. How do I maintain, how do I protect my investment? Can I repatriate my funds? You know, am I gonna get a fair shake if I get in trouble in that country? Am I gonna get a fair shake in the court system, right? How much time do I have to think about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? It's the law in the United States of America. And so for me, in my, our business now, what do we talk about? We talk about countries that are the best for investment are those countries that follow the rule of law. So that's a fundamental pillar, it seems to me, of US foreign policy that every company on this call ought to be talking to their representatives about and ought to be in favor of. The rule of law, the rule of law, and the rule of law. It's, it's, you know, it's the real estate location, location, location of, of, com of commercial diplomacy um, and of commercial foreign policy. And then the other thing is, if you'd allow me, is this whole question of jobs. So, you know, I admire people. I admire people who work in, 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 in NGOs and, and who give assistance and who are in aid programs and the Agency for International Development. I do. But, but, uh, but in my career, when I went places and saw things, what did I see? I see people, I saw people in countries, what they need? They needed a job, right? They needed economic opportunity. They needed some way to provide for their families and get invested in their societies. And one of the things that I spent a lot of time on in Afghanistan when I was the special representative was seeing if we couldn't develop, you know, some kind of economic activity in that country because people need jobs. People needed it in Pakistan too. And so me, I say rule of law. And then the question is, what about our foreign policy? Our foreign policy should be about creating jobs in the United States. That should be about creating jobs overseas. Okay. Ambassador Grossman, um, something you said earlier, your three big ideas, one of them was talking about realigning the definition or the, the relationship between citizens and, and leaders here in the United States. That has set off uh, many questions coming in. A, a lot of people were, were very intrigued by that and, and are very interested in hearing you dive a little bit deeper on that. You know, where, where do you feel like there's some, some misalignment what does that realignment look like in practice um, as we think about how America is engaging moving forward? Well, I, this is a thought, it's not, not original to me, certainly, but it's a thought that I kept coming back to during COVID-19, uh, which is to say COVID-19 exposed a lot of things, some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, but but I, keep, I kept coming back to thinking that, you know, if you were a citizen, Again, I can only speak as an American citizen, but I'll bet you this has 
application to others who are on this call. But people said, kind of, what is my interest here? My interest is being, you know, is, is being protected. My interest is having PPE. My interest is having the right medicine. My interest is in having my government do the right thing by me uh, for, for this pandemic. And it opened up to me a lot of these kinds of questions, which is sort of what's it all for? And, and, and a very good question from the audience, as you've related to me, is sort of what are the specifics here? So again, we've been talking about Afghanistan, and I would put Iraq in here too. And, and you think, so, so what, what citizen interest over the past, I don't know how many years you choose, I, I think citizens felt that these wars, what people call the forever wars, um, weren't serving their interests, right? And again, I, I mean, no disrespect to people who served in those wars, civilians or military, but the public didn't see these activities as being connected to their security and to their interests. So that's one place. And then the COVID um, is another. And then finally, uh, it seems to me also, is the, is the question of, of, of economics. All right, so again, I'm, I'm all for world trade. I think more, you know, more trade, better. But you know, if you look back on globalization, globalization was great for a lot of people, me included, but it wasn't great for everybody. And many, many people got left behind. You, you think of the millions of people in the United States of America who didn't have a pay raise in 20 years, the towns and the communities that were you know, devastated by technological changes, by moving jobs overseas. Um, and, and I think those are important things. And so I think a, there's citizen interest in having strong communities and there's citizen interest in making that part of any conversation about what America is doing abroad. And so I think there are lots of specific questions. The issue now is, you know, how would you define and, and describe a foreign policy that tries to bring those things back into alignment? Not easy. Um, but I do think that uh, issues like, you know, ending these, ending these wars, bringing as much, re, doing as much reshoring as you sensibly can um, without, you know, kind of diminishing our capacities um, and recognizing that uh, people who got left behind, they've got needs, right? And you've got to deal with opioid addiction and you have to deal with communities that have been shattered. Um, and those are, those are very important things. And, and you can't just say, oh, well, diplomats don't deal with them because they're only dealing with foreign policy. This is, this is a, there's, a, there's a unified whole here that we have to return to, that what we're doing abroad matters domestically and what we're doing domestically matters, matters abroad. That's great. I want to dive into one another question that was uh, in the the chat line there, Mr. Ambassador, and it has to deal with the education of women and women's rights, human rights there, not just in Afghanistan, but let's start with Afghanistan. Of course, you had this 20 year window uh, where suddenly women were part of the government and the writing of the Constitution. They were educated and in the workforce uh, as someone who has seven sisters, a mother, a wife, three daughters and two granddaughters. Uh, I, I know the power of that, uh, and I, I, we all know that there has been obviously some back uh, swing there in Afghanistan, uh, but I, I always say don't underestimate uh, the power of that educated woman and the impact they've already had. But from your perspective, uh, Mr. Ambassador, how, does that, how do you see that playing out, uh, again, not just in Afghanistan, but, uh, but around the world? Well, it's a really important question. Let me start with your second, which is to say that I think the role of women in their societies and the role of women in making these decisions for the future of the world is absolutely crucial. Let me give you two examples. So in, I don't know, in my experience, uh, two things were true. One is there was never going to be economic development. We just talked about this, about jobs, the need for jobs overseas. There was never going to be economic development in countries, in countries that I had served in or that I had, part, that I had something to do with unless women were involved in development, right? Unless women were part of the conversation about, about building jobs. It was one of the lessons I think of, you know, the small loan programs like the, in Bangladesh, right? Who did those loans go to? They went to women entrepreneurs. And I'll give you parentheses. When I went to Afghanistan, who were the most interesting people I met in Afghanistan? Female entrepreneurs, bar none, absolutely. They were the most interesting people I met in 
Afghanistan always. And second thing, the other thing I came to believe was that you can't have a successful peace process in this world. Think about Africa, think about Afghanistan, think about anywhere. There are no successful peace processes unless women are involved. So I had the good, good fortune to work on Colombia, Plan Colombia, when I was in government, right? And unless women are involved in peace processes and peace conversations, they don't happen. And so if you think about those two very important things, development, economic development, peace, um, women's role is absolutely crucial. And in all the other areas you talked about as well, politics and education, the judiciary. I, I talk to a lot of people um, overseas and you know it's hard now for Americans, American diplomats maybe to say, well, this is how you should live. But what I do say to people is you live how you want. But it's my observation that successful countries in the 21st century are gonna have certain things in common. And to go back, the first one I say is that they believe in the rule of law. They believe in the sanctity of the individual. They believe in the strong role of women in society. And they believe in the capacity of people to make choices about their own lives, right? And so that's what I think. And, and I tell people, that's my observation. And my observation is, is that countries who will prioritize those things, and there are many more, and people on this call will have lots more, but those are my four, that countries that will prioritize those four things will be more successful than countries that don't. And so then people have to decide for themselves how they want to be. But I, I, I think it'd be a shame if American diplomats ever came to the time where they couldn't speak out for those kinds of, um, those kinds of ideals. I think that's what being an American diplomat is all about. Great. Ambassador Grossman, I, I'm mindful of time. Uh, this hour has flown by. I've got a, a list a mile long of additional questions. I'd love to dive deeper into uh, Saudi Arabia, the uh, GCC countries. Uh, we spend more time with the GCC than just about any other region of the world. We've got eight companies in Dubai right now. We'll take a few trips to Saudi Arabia next year. And just such a dynamic part of the world. Um, so just want to, uh, I was hoping to talk about that, um, but we're, we're out of time, but just a plug for anybody watching to so please reach out because there is historic change taking place. That change creates opportunities for companies who know how to engage. And this is an area I know where the Cohen Group is, is, is put uh, significant time and energy into. Um, but Ambassador Grossman, that'll be another conversation for another day. Now, to so. your final word, your, your final piece of advice is you think about the companies that are tuning in today, um, given everything that we've been talking about, the state of the world, what would be that, that, that last piece of advice that you would give to them as they get back to work and, and trying to go out there and compete and win in markets around the world? Well, Maz, I think I'd give two. One is, is that no question from my perspective and our company's perspective, there are opportunities available uh, for those that have the capacity and the nerve to try to, to, try to take them. And secondly, um, for those companies that have that desire and have that interest. Uh, institutions like the World Trade Center of Utah, and if you'd allow me, US embassies abroad um, and others are, are, are just fundamental partners um, because they can help in so many ways. And so, you know, Utah companies, other companies that are uh, aligning with you are making an enormous right choice. And again, I, I recognize my bias a hundred times over, but you know, for American companies, uh, those embassies, ambassadors, and people abroad, they're there to serve you. They're there to promote your interests. They're there to help you. And so please, um, I, I hope you'll take advantage of that resource as well. So I think people should pursue these and lucky them. They've got some great institutions to help them. Yeah. Well, Mr. Ambassador Grossman, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I have to tell our audience another important contribution that you have made and that is as an author and novelist. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I have to reveal that Ambassador Grossman just co-authored a fantastic book on Iran. Uh, it's called Believers, Love and Death in Tehran. And he co-authored that book with Ambassador John Limbert about the personal interactions of people, how they're impacted by revolution in Iran conflict. It is called Believers. It is available on Amazon. So many different aspects, Ambassador Grossman. And, we are very pleased that you were made this presentation possible for us. And uh, I learned so much from today's presentation. Thank you, it's been my honor. The book is fiction. 
Um, thank you, Bahman. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I'm honored to. Hey, Bahman, thank you for that. Rayanne, uh, thank you so much for organizing this. It'd be helpful, I think, if uh, let's include a link uh, uh, to the book out to everybody who signed in today so they have a chance to, to check that out. Um, read a little bit of fiction with the nonfiction that we're all uh, consuming on on a regular basis. So, but but thank you, Boyd. Thank you, Bahman, uh, Ambassador Grossman. Thank you so much. And just in conclusion, you know, one key takeaway uh, uh, for me, and this came from your, your response to my question about you know subnational engagement, is that whether it's just you true for Utah companies or American companies, to be effective in our global engagement to find success, that success really is a product of two factors. One, we have to be globally competitive, and Utah absolutely is, and our companies absolutely are. And two, we have to be globally engaged. If you have those two factors, you're competitive out there in the world and you're fully engaged, then there's great success that awaits for us. And so I'd encourage anybody that's listening in, uh, whether live or on YouTube, please reach out. We want to plug in, help you assess uh, whether or not you're globally competitive. Uh, if not, what we can do to get you there. Um, if so, then we can help you calibrate your global engagement so you can go out there and find success in the world. And that success is so important, not only for individual companies, but for, for our nation. Companies that engage internationally, grow faster, create jobs faster. Those jobs are higher paying jobs and those jobs are far more resilient. So there's all this public good that comes as our companies are getting out there to compete and win in international markets. So thank you everyone for participating. Uh, thank you to our audience. And I hope that everybody has a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank Gross. you so much. Thank you.